Hello, my name is Ed Frawley. I own uh, Learbird. We're here filming uh, some new training videos with our friend Andrew Ramsey from California. The videos we're filming are on pet dog detection, uh, nose work training. It's a, it's a new sport in America where pet dog owners can get involved in training their dogs to do detection work. And we thought we'd just take a few minutes because there's a lot of people that don't understand or have never heard of this dog sport. So we thought we'd take a few minutes and talk to Andrew. Uh, I'll ask him some questions because quite frankly, it's a new sport for me. While I have uh, an extensive background in, uh, as a canine handler and narcotic dog handler, this sport is new to me. And I thought we would take a few minutes to help educate people on uh, this new dog sport. So Andrew, uh, why don't we start off with just having you explain to us what nose work is. Okay. Um, nose work is um, it's an activity you can do with your dog. It's um, pretty much just like detection you'd like that law enforcement or military would do. Um, but it's an activity that people are doing with pet dogs. Um, the dogs are searching for um, several different odors and re um, depending on how you want to train your dog or what you want to put what odor you want to put them on you can um, kind of cater the training to that but um, it's just like regular detection for the military or law enforcement but people are doing it with pet dogs a good you know and that brings up a good question on the on the odors that they're training for I think we need to make it clear that we're not dealing with narcotics and we're not dealing with explosives why don't you why don't you Talk a little bit about what kind of odors they train on. Um, people are training on different odors. The, there are some common ones that are birch, anise, clove. Um, some people are training their dogs to indicate on vanilla. Um, there's um, you can really you can train your dog to find anything you wanted to as long as it's legal, of course. But um, it's really up to you. Mm -hmm. And it's this within the sport, the, the sport. And right now, there's one organization in the sport. And, Quite frankly, it's not going to surprise me that in the future there's going to be other organizations that do this too. And these organizations are all dealing with common odors. We're not dealing with illegal odors or anything like this. I'm correct in that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the organization that's currently um, has people doing the sport of nose work, the dogs find um, birch, anise, and clove. So yes, of course, they're legal odors that anyone can purchase. You can get them through um, the organization or you can buy them online. Mm -hmm. um, they're not difficult to find. And then you and your friends can train your dogs to find these odors. And it's really a lot of fun. What kind of dogs do you see people using? Oh, you see everything. Anything from a dachshund to um, the working breeds. It's the, the good thing about nose work is really any dog can do it. Dogs are always using their nose. And um, we can really have a lot of fun with them doing that. Um, but as far as the different breeds, all breeds are doing this. I, mean, I have people that say, well, can my dog do nose work? I have a 12-year-old a Chihuahua or you know, a lot of us have Malinois. Um, dogs with the lowest amount of drive are doing it. And um, the typical dogs that we would think of doing detection or protection sports or other activities are doing it as well. So it's really actually, um, it will reach a broad audience of people um, because really anyone can do it. So it's really not people that have protection dogs are doing it no it's um it's not really limited to like we normally like again with your background in law enforcement we think of the typical detection dog as very driven very motivated um the fun thing about nose work is there's dogs that may not have the same level of drive especially for um a, a rubber type reward um so you can have low motivation dogs that work for food still can do detection like you would with the other dogs yeah and it's a lot of fun it's, uh, you may not see it in the video, but Andrew has uh, his dog here. Why don't you in introduce her? <laughs> this is Mitzi. <laughs> this is Mitzi. Mitzi is my 11-year-old dachshund. Um, she goes everywhere with me. And um, she's also a close buddy of um, my Malinois, uh -huh. who also goes everywhere with me. He just doesn't fit on my lap here while yeah. I'm talking. Yeah, she's pretty cool. We did some videotape of her yesterday doing the nose work. I think that... Uh, that's the cool thing that I see about this dog sport is that we had our secretaries from work uh, who are not competitors in any dog sport. 
They have dogs. They love dogs. They have pet dogs. We had them bring them in, bring them in yesterday. We had uh, Sharon brought her pug in. Uh, it's just cool to see this work, and the dogs love it. There's no compulsion to this thing. Uh, it's all drive work. Uh, why don't you explain kind of the format for uh, how the current sport is set up? Like, why don't you tell us what an ORT stands for, and and uh, how do and the different levels to this sport? Why don't you explain that? Okay. Um, well, before you can actually compete with your dog, you have to do what is called an ORT, an odor recognition test, and that basically shows that your dog. Um, has odor recognition, like it, like it states, um, so that you can actually enter the trial and um, you basically have proved that your dog does know the, the target odor. Um, there are three odors, again, for this organization that are, again, they're birch, um, anise, and clove. You have to do an ORT for each odor mm -hmm. to show that your dog knows those odors. Um, at level one, there's three levels. Okay. And at level one, there's four searches, and there's actually four searches in all levels. Okay. Um, but the four searches are an exterior search, which is where there is an area with um, a perimeter that's, in, that's outside. And there, anywhere within that area, there's going to be one of the target odors planted somewhere. Your dog has to find it there. Um, an interior search, which is, can be anything inside of a building, such you know, like your facility, your training facility, or um, an office, or something like that. Um, a vehicle search, which um, it's either three or five vehicles, and there can be um, in level one. There, again, there's just one plant in each one of these. So each area has one find at level one. Correct. At level one. Yes. Um, and then the fourth search would be um, what's called a container search, which is um, 15 to 20 boxes, depending on the level. And then in one of those boxes, there is a target odor that your dog has to indicate on. Now. Uh... When they're going to put a target odor up, so you've got three orders, odors, what do they put out for the dog to find? What is the odor on? Uh, yes, well, the, um, most people that are training for the sport have the odors in an actual uh, liquid form as an extract for birch, clove, and anise. And they take that extract and drop it, just, a, just one drop on a Q-tip. And then you can hide that Q-tip wherever you want to hide it for, you know, for your plant to train on. And that's just what we use in training, are yes. those three things, and then we use the Q-tips. Correct. With, with the, the with, gloves on them. Yes, yes. Cool, cool. Um, during the odor recognition test, when you say that the dog has to indicate an odor, what do you mean by that? What do they have to do for an indication? Um, well, you can, you can pick your indication. Um, there's, there's certain indications that you get faulted for um, that are penalized, but you, um, you write down actually what your indication is on your paperwork before you enter trials. Um, and at level one, it doesn't have to be so defined, but they, the organization is more, it has to be more specific as you go up in level. So but what it, kind but of... It, okay, what so kind it of could things? be um, a sit, a down. Mm -hmm. um, the dogs that I train, almost all of them are what we call it focus response dogs. So, they, um, as they're searching, they, um, when they're picking up on the target odor, they'll bracket to source, they'll work to source, and when they get to the closest possible place before there's a physical barrier to the, where the highest concentration of the target odor is, um, the dogs that I train focus right on that spot because that's where they know their reward will appear. Why don't you explain what bracket the source means? Um, well, with, within the scent cone, um, when the dog hits the odor, just bracketing would be them working back and forth to get to where the odor is actually sourced from, where the, it's all coming from. Um, as far as the air currents, when they first um, hit or picked up on the odor, it's them working to the highest concentration of where the, or, like the origin of the scent actually comes from. So you've got your odor out there, and it's this big cone, and the dog goes from one side of that cone to the other side of the cone, and, and it gets, gradually it gets narrower and takes narrower. it straight in. Right. And then, so your dogs and the way you train, you want them to... To move in to the point of the cone and then do what? Um, with the uh, focus response dogs, they should, again, they, like you said, when they are out here, they, they somewhat, they smell the target odor. They're, the scent cones are going to get smaller and smaller. They're going to work to the, the source. And the dogs that I train, I want to focus at that source. 
back when uh, I handled narcotics dogs in the sheriff's department, we did a, uh, an active indication, and by an active indication, when my dogs would uh, get to narcotics, they would scratch it where their narcotics are. And you don't do that. You do the passive indication. Yes. Um, yeah, so there's, um, within the, as far as the indications and responses, there are several different kinds. Um, yes, all the ones that I do are for sure passive. Um, and with, even within passive, they are, they're focused. So I want the dog to focus at the odor source. Um, I believe in the organization that's currently doing nose work, you are, um, again, you're faulted or penalized if your dog has an aggressive response. Oh, they don't want that. They don't, I think, because it's contamination of the training area for the next dog that are coming. So they want everything to kind of maintain, um, to be clean and sterile. So it's fair that to even the playing field as much as possible for all the dogs that are searching or working um, in the trial. Are, are the, uh, the dogs limited by size? In other words, you see... You see in police work or military work, you know, we're dealing with the majority of dogs are Belgian Malinois and German Shepherds. Now, why don't you talk a little bit about dogs that are her size? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, again, the great thing about this sport is any dog can do it. So you'll see dogs anywhere from Dachshund size to Great Danes that are competing and are, are actually participating in this activity. At the higher levels, the plants can be, at well, level three, the plants can be up to six feet tall. So there are that would there would be some issues possibly with a very small dog, but you could still work around that. That would be training. It'd be a little bit more difficult. But for the most part, even little dogs can do this. Um, do you see people coming into this sport that are actively training their dogs in say uh, competition obedience or agility work or fly ball work? Can yes, they do both? Can they do all of it? Definitely. Um, um, a lot of people that I'm working with are involved in many other sports um, and, and there's no conflict in any way to do this. So um, if you are doing agility or fly ball or, or rally or whatever it is you're doing, there's no conflict and it's just another really fun thing that you can do with your dog. So is it the type of thing that you have to have a big training center to do or you know, maybe you want to talk about how easy it is to set up the training? Yeah, um, in the very beginning you kind of need a, a specific area to train in to do um, to train a few things within um, for the dog, mm -hmm. but once you get past that, it, the good thing about it again is you can do this anywhere. You don't need a field, you don't need a decoy, you don't need all the jumps and stuff you might need for agility. Um, like many other the sports we do, there's a lot of equipment and um, stuff that you need to participate in. Mm -hmm. But with nose work, once you get the dog um, trained, like there are is a, a time period where you're going to want some a specific training area initially in the beginning. But once you get past that, you can do it anywhere. You and your friends can say, hey, today we're going to train over at this park or tomorrow we're going to train behind the mall over here. Anywhere you want to go, you can do nose work and it's a lot how, of fun. How long does it take to, to do it? It really depends on the dog, the drive of the dog. Um, some dogs progress faster than others, just like anything else we do with dog training. Um, it, it really can vary quite a bit within um, how much you're, you're training the dog. Um, but the motivating, um, the drive the dog has for the reward is kind of the, the factor that decides that. So the lower drive dogs um, take a little bit longer, but it's still not too long. And um, ones that may have social or environmental issues could take a little bit longer, but you can still work through all that. And that's just, that's part of the fun of dog training, I believe. I think that, uh, like we're in our second day of filming here, and, and yesterday we had some dogs, uh, like Cindy's dog, Rush. Uh, I would say is at the upper scale of a high drive dog. He's had a lot of yeah. obedience training. You take a dog like Rush, in your opinion, how long would it take people that have dogs like that to get to, get to the ORT, odor recognition test? Um, not very long. I know, to say a specific time, I mean, it could still would vary, but if you Maybe train, training sessions. That was yeah. the wrong, wrong word I used. I should say training sessions. If somebody say, let's say, they work it every day or they work let's say they work it twice a day some people are going to do it twice a week but let's yeah. cut it down let's say two times a day for 10 minutes how long do you think it would take rush to get to the ort um i think rush could probably do an ort is probably 10 sessions or less with 10 training much. sessions yeah again and on the ort you don't actually have to have a very specific response with all my clients, I still push that before they do the RT, I want them to have a specific response, but that's not required. Mm -hmm. You just have to read your dog's um, change of behavior, and you have to be able to tell the certifying official or the judge that's there mm -hmm. where the odor is as far as which box. But um, 
I prefer with the people that I work with, at least my students or clients, that before we do it, we have a very specific response. Okay, so um, let's talk because we, we're going to, I'm going to use some of the videotape that we had of these other dogs okay. that had environmental problems, that had uh, not a lot of drive. That doesn't mean they're bad dogs. It, a lot of people have pet dogs that can't go out and do high drive competition sports. So these other dogs, if, if they had a handler that wanted to do this and they wanted to do it twice a day for five or 10 minutes, let's take the other end of the spectrum and talk about dogs with environmental problems or low drive dogs. What do you think there? And nobody's going to hold you to, yeah. I mean, we're not going to say, ah, Andrew said this. Mm -hmm. No, that's not the case. But what do you think? Uh, um, it's again, it's a little more difficult to, to say, and it depends on the dog because some dogs actually come in and they show a lot of those issues in the beginning and they work through them very fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and it doesn't take as much effort, um, as far as, um, us as trainers to get them through it. Some dogs, they may have issues that are a little more severe and it can take quite a while. But um, as far as how many training sessions, it, it's really, it would be hard to put a number on it. Really? But I, th I think it's, it's doable. I haven't come across any dogs so far that haven't um, been able to work through this eventually. And they figured out, and they figured out it's a fun thing to do with mom or dad or, you know, the handler. Mm -hmm. um, they really enjoyed doing it once they figured out that all they have to do is use their nose, which they're using all the time. And then they're going to get their favorite reward, which is... Um, Again, depends on the dog, but that's another thing that is very important for us to figure out is what really motivates our dogs and how we're going to work them. That's a good question, though. So we're talking about uh, motivating the dogs. Why don't we talk a little bit about the kinds of rewards and how we, you know, let's talk about first the kinds of rewards that we're using, and then we'll go into that in a little more detail, too. Okay. Um, well, again, you're, we're going to use whatever the dog likes the most, and for different dogs that's different things um, a lot of dogs work for a toy whether um, it's again some kind of rubber bouncy ball type toy something like that something in that category um, other dogs will work for like a tug or something that they the animal can tug with um, but a, the big um, I'd say a large quantity of the actual pet dogs that are just your everyday pet dogs are working for food um, and within food um, that again can vary quite a bit from they're the kibble or whatever that they're eating every day to very high value um, other types of food rewards, you know, um, really anything. I, mean, I have one client that works her dog for bacon. Um, I have other clients that work for really just about anything. Um, they kind of, they figure out with their dog what the dog really likes. And then um, when the dog figures out that by using its nose, it can obtain that reward, that food, it really has a high value to it. They really enjoy the activity. That's what... Uh... That's one of the things that we're going to cover in the DVD, like we show people uh, how to test their dogs on various kinds of toys uh, so we can show people how to set up a test over one toy over another. And I mean, it's something that we used back when we were training narcotics dogs, but the average pet owner doesn't know how to do that. Same thing goes with food. We show people how to determine what food does this dog like the best and then it's a whole lot easier. A lot of people back in the day, the old days, you know, um, training narcotics dogs, the military back in the 70s and 80s, only used to train their dogs with food. And old school narcotics trainers, me included, used to say, this is foolish. This is really foolish. The military had a program where they would determine the optimal weight of a dog and then they would reduce that dog's weight by 15 percent and that dog was starved all the time and for that the dog would go out and search for narcotics or search for bombs and we don't do that no this is totally totally a different system yeah, and it's about 150 times better than the way it was 20 or 30 years ago Definitely. Like other areas of dog training, things have definitely come a long way. Yeah. Why don't you, uh, why don't we take a second and talk about, you know, what your background is, what you did with the government, that type of thing. Okay. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about that and I'll ask questions. Okay. Um, I am a lifelong dachshund lover for starts. Um, for starters, I grew up having dachshunds, miniature dachshunds, um, just like Mitzi here. Um, and I always will have a red smooth miniature dachshund female, pretty much just like this. Um, I got my first Malinois in 2003. 
um, and, be, and became active in protection sports of primarily Mondial Ring, but a little bit of French Ring as well. Um, but I worked for the DOD for six years. Four years I worked in the, the Belgian Malinois breeding program, the puppy program, um, which um, supplements the amount of dogs the U.S. government has to purchase from Europe, pretty much is what the, the purpose of that is. So it's an in-house breeding operation that the, the government runs, again, to supplement so they don't have to buy as many dogs in Europe and not have such a, a foreign dependence on dogs, which is, is hard to avoid. Where's that run out of? It's, um, all the, um, the military working dog program courses and operations are run out of Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. That's where you worked? That's where I was, yes. So um, it's a joint service operation with um, all branches of the military. And um, there's anywhere from 700 to 1,000 dogs there every day. Um, it's um, also the headquarters for all of TSA's training and their operations. So anytime you go to the airport and you see a dog that's um, doing explosive detection, that dog was trained also at Lackland Air Force Base. And so was that handler. Okay. Um, but I was there for six years, um, four years in the in the breeding program, and then two years I was a an Air Force civilian, um, a civilian trainer that trained um, and certified dogs before they were shipped out to the field at um, the dog training section or the dog training school. That brings up a, an interesting point, really probably not a lot to do with nose work, but I think a lot of people would find it interesting, and maybe a lot of people don't know that the military uh, has a breeding program where we breed our own dogs. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. I find it uh, kind of fascinating. Do they breed a lot of litters? And then what did you do? What was your job? What did, how did you fit into that? Yeah, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, the breeding program is actually a really, really cool program. Um, the breeding program selects suitable breeding candidates and um, produces litters. The litters are born on Lackland Air Force Base. Uh -huh. They live there for the first eight weeks of their life. Uh, during that time, we expose them to all kinds of environmental stimulation things. Um, they see lots of people. Um, just a lot of really cool stuff that goes on there. It's kind of like a little science lab to me. Yeah. Um, at eight weeks, they're, they go into foster families, which are very carefully selected, um, that are extremely patriotic individuals that really want to help the government and um, raise working dogs for uh, the future of the needs of the, the government. Um, they're there from eight weeks to seven months. And during that time period, they come back to Lackland every two weeks, and they're evaluated for their desire to... To, to bite essentially, but to, for, um, to chase and, and bite a rag, you know, puppy bite work, like you'd see in a puppy bite work video mm -hmm. that you've produced. Um, to chase and retrieve thrown objects. Again, um, environmental stability and um, sociability. Um, we would test the dogs um, and we'd film these tests at eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, seven months, and a year. But at seven months, the, the puppies come back from the foster families and they're, they're, they come back to Lackland Air Force Base again. Um, they're placed in the kennels and we would test them as far as which ones we want to keep to stay in training. What breeds? It's the vast majority of the breedings are Malinois, Belgian Malinois. Um, there were a couple breeding females that were Dutch Shepherds when I was there, mm -hmm. but it's pretty much a, a Malinois program. Is it a, are there a lot of females breeding? There are a lot. Um, they produce anywhere from, I'd say, at least 10 to 12 litters a year, somewhere in there. Um, there's multi others. Yeah, they have their own facility just as far as keeping the breeding females and all the, the puppies are actually in training. They have their, their kennels are separate than the other kennels for the, the dogs that are either procured in Europe or stateside. But um, it's oh, it, the puppy program has its own little section and it's actually a really cool operation. It'd be interesting to go there and visit it sometime. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very they, cool. Do they have a lot of guys working in this? Um, it's actually a pretty small section for how much work is done. That's the great thing about the foster program is there's no way that the, the program could run without those foster families volunteering. Is it hard to find them? Um, it's not too difficult. Um, they, they run some advertisements in specific places that would target the kind of people that we would like to, um, to actually raise the puppies. Mm -hmm. And the, another good thing is there's a lot of people that pretty much raise a puppy turned in and just take another one. I had a, one family that raised nine dogs while I was there. Wow. So yeah, it's, it's excellent. They, they raise one puppy, they turn it in, and then they get another one, and they just keep doing it over and over again. All um, down in San Antonio, all the foster people are in San Antonio. Correct, yeah. They have to be within, I think, an hour or hour and a half drive from San Antonio to, to participate. My stepson, Andrew, who's also named Andrew, <laughs> is joined the Air Force, and he's going down to Lackland next year to go through uh, basic training when he gets out of high school. 
you got to get me set up to have a tour of that. Sure, definitely. That'd be a cool thing. Definitely. I don't think they'd let me in with a camera, do you think? I don't know. We'd have to ask some people. Really? We could try. We could try <laughs> that. See. Oh, that's cool. Well, I think that's a fascinating thing. I, uh, did you have, when you would put these dogs out and then you would bring them back, what kind of success rate did you have in place? We're kind of getting, you know, maybe off the sub subject on nose work, but I think a lot of people that look at sure. this are interested sure. in dog training. What kind of success rate did you have in place in these dogs? Um, when I was there, again, this was, things possibly have changed since then, but there, we had a success rate of about 54%. Yeah, and I always tell good. people that a lot of times you hear that the people say, oh, only 54%, but they don't understand exactly that that's, that's very good. Yeah, it is. But when, um, especially when you take into account what an actual military working dog has to do. So we have very high expectations for these dogs. Mm -hmm. And the fact that 54% of the dogs that we bred could do that is actually it's quite phenomenal. Uh, what happened to dogs that didn't make it? Um, the dogs that couldn't make it were placed into suitable homes if they were just going to be pet dogs. Mm -hmm. The ones that did have drive and maybe were not uh, entirely appropriate to go just to the general public were put on um, a law enforcement only adoption list mm -hmm. where local law enforcement agencies can come and evaluate the dog and possibly they might with um, a little more time or um, more dedication than, um, than we possibly would have because we had so many dogs, they could um, put the dog to work and it would fit into their agency. So like... Uh from a nose work standpoint, a lot of the background that you've got in training for this sport comes from that. Yes, my, so my background as far as detection, um, which entirely relates to doing nose work or um, pet det dog detection, is from um, mainly explosive detection for the military. Um, within the breeding program, we only trained explosive detection dogs. Mm -hmm. And as far as the dogs at Lackland, the vast, vast majority of them are explosive detection dogs. That's what you know is, is much more needed than um, narcotic detection dogs for the, the current needs of the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. um, but the training methods that I use for nose work um, come primarily from my background for the, for the military. How long ago did you leave Lackland? I left Lackland in 2010. Okay. And now you live in San Francisco? Um, in the Bay Area, East Bay Area. Yeah. And what are you doing out there? Um, I, well, I live in the East Bay area and I have my company, Ramsey Canine Services. Um, I do some protection sports stuff as far as Mondio Ring and little French Ring, little Schutzen, but primarily Mondio Ring is my, the sport of my choice. Mm -hmm. Um, also do a little bit of law enforcement stuff as far as patrol dog training and, um, detection. Mm -hmm. Um, I of course do nose work, which I, um, so the enjoy. nose work thing, uh, you have students. And you come in, they come in, you give classes? To Correct, yeah. So I do um, group classes in, again, in the East Bay area for nose work and um, also do private lessons. Do you take, do people, uh, have you take dogs in for training in nose work? Yes, um, I do a small amount of, of inboard training um, and some of it actually is for nose work. So if someone doesn't want to put a, a whole lot of time as far as how long they have to wait before they see the results, um, I can take in their dog and I will personally work it and I can get the dog kind of up and running at a mm -hmm. faster rate than I would if I would work with them one-on-one -on -one for a longer period of time. Um, and then they can take the dog back and they're ready to have fun with the dog. I know that, uh, you know, we're going to finish filming tomorrow and you got to jump on a plane, fly back to San Francisco and turn around the very next day and fly to Canada for a seminar. Uh, you do seminars, obviously, on nose work. Yes. And uh, what we'll do for people that, or dog clubs that are interested in getting involved in this, because I think that once this sport gets to be better known, it's going to explode. I mean, this is some cool, cool stuff. Very cool. I mean, people that come in and do this, they don't have to come into it from competition dog sports. They don't have to, I mean, why don't you address what kind of training a dog should have before he starts nose work, if any. Yeah, the, the thing that's great about it is they really don't need any prior training. Um, you can do it with your rescue dog or your purebred dog. It doesn't matter as far as the size, the age. Um, once we figure out what motivates your dog, your dog can do nose work. And um, the, the, we see it with all breeds, all sizes, all ages, um, and they, but they don't need any prior training. It's kind of cool because it really uh, 
goes a long way for helping the relationship between the dog and the handler. Yes. Because it's all motivation and it's all rewards. It is. And a lot of the, the Michael the Michael videos will greatly facilitate with that too as far as getting people to play properly and uh, motivate the dog. Mm -hmm. and that's a, that's a, the biggest part of the, the whole thing right there. Which is, I, <laughs> I'm the one that's supposed to be answering questions and you bring up the, the good point and that is that, you know, everything that we're doing in this video is built around marker training. It's all... It's all motivation, it's marker training, it fits in with all this other motivational work that we do and all the other videos that we do. That's the beauty of the whole thing. It, it merges with the other style of training videos you have perfectly. Um, and again, there's there's really no compulsion. There's not a lot of, of any kind of corrections like that in nose work. Um, as a whole, there's very small situations where that happens, but it's a very fun, positive activity. Well, I don't know how many hours we trained yesterday and filmed yesterday. I never saw a correction. No. Not one correction on not one dog, and a lot of those dogs, when they came in and they first started, I'd have bet you a beer at the end of the day, they weren't, you weren't going to get them to do an odor indication, and I was wrong on every single dog. I learned a lot yesterday watching those dogs train. It's, it, it really, no matter how old you get in dog training, and no matter how long you are around dog training, and I've been around it for over 50 years, it's really cool when you start and see something new like that. Yeah. It's exciting. I mean, it it's really exciting. This thing is going to blow up. Yeah. And uh, the cool thing is, is if there's dog clubs out there uh, on the East Coast or anywhere, you'll go anywhere and do seminars. I'll go anywhere, yeah. And if you run a dog club and you're watching this videotape and you want to do something cool, call them, have them come and give a seminar. How, normally, that's a good question. How long are your seminars? Um, to mo normally, they're two days. But right. ideally for me, three days is kind of the good good number um for i could do a whole lot in four days but a lot of times clubs can't get you know people to take um, time off work and they just are available for the weekend yeah but three to four days you can get a ton done but in a normal weekend we can also do a whole lot of work um and a lot of times i'm doing a lot more training for the handlers and um explaining the method that i use and um all that stuff so that once i leave they can kind of continue it and uh -huh. um, make a ton of progress but in, in two to three days really what we'll do is we'll put up, uh, what's the best way how to get in touch with you? Facebook, email, um, website? Probably just go to my website, um, and that's www.ramseyk9.com. We're putting it right there, okay. right now. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very cool. So then they email you, and then you get back to them that way. Yeah, yeah that'll work. Well, I think what's cool about the, the videos that we're going to do, I think at this point we're talking about at least four videos, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe you want to give a recap of, kind of what our goals are for these different videos. Okay. Um, yeah, ideally, I think the first video will be everything people need to get started in this activity. Um, so that'll be everything from selecting your motivator, um, finding out how you're going to reward your dog, um, putting a search behavior on cue, teaching your dog pattern, um, giving the dog um, an indication, teaching the indication to the dog. Um, but it'll all be the things that are needed for... Um, just for your dog to alert on one odor. Yeah, and um, I'll have a segment in that DVD on how to set up a little training area. Yes, and that's very important. And uh, when we do it, I will show the mistakes that we made before you came on how, you know, I, I used to train when we trained narcotics dogs and you have much better ideas. So I'll show the mistakes that we made down there. I'll show the way to do it and then i'll show you the changes that we made overnight and quite frankly we're not talking about a lot of money in setting no, this no. whole thing up i mean to set up this training area was really nothing yeah really nothing it was us using some old furniture that we had yeah a lot of my clients are friends that are training for nose work all they i mean now a lot of them are going to garage sales yeah. and driving around seeing what i they know can pick up the side of the road and i have some friends have actually built spectacular setups for training this this activity mm -hmm. and and they haven't spent any money so yeah. they've done it all for free um, and just as far as acquiring the equipment and um, the furniture and stuff for the dogs to search mm -hmm. um, but like we stated earlier once you get past that using that training lab that area you can do this activity anywhere and so you don't need all this other you know like in other areas of dog training you need all this equipment and money and it's expensive and can, and expensive and absolutely and this doesn't cost nothing nothing i mean you've got to get your kit we're going to end up putting a kit together for people that don't want to try and go out and figure out how to do it themselves. So, no, it's a cool, cool deal. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so that's going to be level one. We're going to show uh, what the handler has to do. We're going to show how the handler and 
what do you want to call the person that helps you? You got a name that you want to use? Um, normally, I ref- when I'm discussing this, people, I refer to um, the handler as a handler, of course, and then right. the trainer okay. is the other person. So we're gonna we're gonna show how those two work together. Yes, there's gonna be a section in there because when you, as the trainer, are delivering the rewards, you make it look easy. It's gonna be a big part of our uh, video in showing how the t- how the trainer needs to deli- how how and when the trainer needs to deliver the reward. That's a big thing. It's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. So then, on the other DVDs that we're going to film in the future here, mm-hmm. um, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, on the other um, DVDs, we'll cover um, introducing the dog to different training areas, adding additional odors, um, and stuff like that. There will be some other videos that will explain uh, and just address problems that can occur, aggressive responses, friend responses, false alerts, uh, dogs walking odor and not responding. Um, it'll have a whole, you know, problem because hopefully with people that are doing this program, it will run smoothly, but there will be those people that run into problems and there will be, um, another video that will explain how to fix those things if they do occur. Hopefully Mm -hmm. they won't, but if they do, um, people need to know how to address those problems just like with anything else we do with dogs. And, um, I I possibly would like to do another one that was, that would be just about different, um, electronic payment systems and some other stuff like that to pay the dog, um, because some people are, are gearheads and gadget people and they'll <laughs> want to set up some very high-tech training areas, which is, like we said, it's not necessary, but there's some people that want to do that. You know what I think as I watch this, that uh, I wish I would have known things like this back when I was on the Sheriff's Department. And I see this as being a huge benefit for a lot of small departments that don't have a police canine program. I got an email last night or yesterday, I got another one this morning from uh, two different guys in small departments that want to get a canine program going. They can go a long way towards getting their dog trained here. They don't and won't learn the law on, on when you can deploy your dog, how you can deploy your dog, that whole thing. They're still going to have to go someplace to get that kind of training, but they can get a lot of detector work done here. They can get a huge, huge amount of foundation work because this training, while we're using birch and clove, they could just as easily use cocaine, methamphetamine. They could just as easily use C4, black powder, or whatever to train their dogs. Yeah. This is going to be uh, a huge thing for pet owners, but it's also going to be a huge thing for small police departments yeah. around here that want to train their dogs. Absolutely. Really good. It's a good deal.